What is up, Brad fans? How you doing? How you living? Uh, I hope you had a wonderful summer. We are back from our sort of summer break. Uh, and this is an episode that was recorded earlier in the summer. And it revolves around science communication, obviously. That's a common theme on this show. Um, and it was the idea for it came from coverage I was seeing over the summer of Jonathan Haidt's new book, The Anxious Generation. And just to be clear, we're not going to discuss the content of the book at all. Uh, to give you some context, uh, Jonathan Haidt is a very well-known uh, social science researcher, and his work uh, that, that has become so popular really focuses on the issues of social media and children. And so his, you know, major thesis, I guess, if I could paraphrase it very quickly, is that uh, the reason we're seeing so much uh, anxiety, depression, these kind of things in um, teenagers is the way that kids are not being allowed free play. They're overly coddled, let's say, overly protected. And then also there's a, there's a big influence of social media in this sort of going from a sort of uh, what we would call like the old school way of growing up where you're outside playing, tumbling around, scraping your knees to everything being online and digital. Um, and he makes the case that this is, this is not good. Um, but again, we're not going to discuss the content of, the, of, of, of that argument or of this research, but really this book, this latest book of his, becomes a New York Times bestseller. It's it's all over the media. You can see it. I'm seeing it in a lot of my feeds, and I know that that's you know algorithmic algorithmically driven. So maybe people aren't seeing it or whatever. But it did jump into the mainstream, and then I started to see smaller outlets like PBS and some more niche sort of science news uh, outlets publishing the critiques. You know, the, the, the researchers that disagree with his thesis. And it was very clear that the, the critiques were not jumping into the mainstream like his argument was jumping into the mainstream. And that got me thinking about, well, what do we, how do we handle these issues when we say, you know, like, let's say the, the, the phrase we all heard during COVID, uh, the science isn't settled. And very rarely is the science you know, settled, right? Like that's kind of one of the hallmarks of science. And then you get into the process of science. Well, why isn't it settled? How can we say, you know, one thing is more likely than the other? You know, can we make concrete statements when it comes to health and raising our kids and, and all of these things that are important to us? And so all of these questions started bubbling up into, into my mind. And I had this really uh, set of questions and format that I was going to do for this episode with our guest, who is Jay Ingram. Uh, people who have listened to the show before uh, know Jay. Uh, people who uh, grew up in Canada or live in Canada know Jay. He's a longtime science journalist, broadcaster. He hosted uh, TV shows in Canada, Daily Planet, the first ever daily science news show for multiple years, 14, I believe. Um, and he's written books. He's been on the radio, uh, the, the flagship science program for the CBC, Quirks and Quarks. He was a longtime host of that. He's been all over. And he's one of the first people to really give me a shot, uh, a push, let's say, uh, into doing this career. So I, I always love talking uh, with Jay because he's a good friend, good mentor. And he's got a ton of experience in this. He's been doing this for a long, long time. So I had this plan of walking through all of these sort of questions, you know, focusing on Jonathan Haidt's book as the sort of case study, you know, why is this popular uh, versus other things? What, how does the critique um, get more popular? If that's, if that's your goal, how are you trying to do that? And very quickly into the conversation, we went in a lot of different places. And so I kind of threw the script out in a good way. This is a good thing. Because um, like I said, Jay has been doing this a long time and he has a lot of interesting thoughts. Um, and so we had a really good conversation about this. We covered, well, we tried to cover because a lot of these things we don't really, we still, we're working through them, right? It's a work in progress, uh, just like science itself. We covered how, what do you do if you're a scientist, a researcher, someone with uh, an informed opinion who wants to disagree? What's the best way to do that? How do, how do you get your message out there? We use uh, examples of, you know, some of the big science podcasts, the Andrew Huberman's, the Lex Friedman's, 
uh, these kind of things. We talk about, you know, what's the best way to deal with that? Why are scientists maybe sometimes wary of going on these shows? Um, we really focus on like, what do you need to make a proper critique, right? Like, how do you present a proper critique of something, let's say, that you science that is in the mainstream that that, that you disagree with? And at the crux of that is you need to be able to communicate the process. And Jay says in this, in all the years of doing this, he's yet to find a really good way to communicate uh, the process of science, right? And I think that's a really important point. And then we go on to, to again, put this in the context of some examples, health misinformation. There's so much out there. Um, and people are, you know, really ready to, you know, jump on board with some stuff that maybe doesn't have a lot of scientific rigor behind it. And, you know, they want to question the professional scientists when it comes to health. But yet, like, how do you then how do you how do you combat that with, again, process stories, which is very boring and, and, and difficult to do? Um, we talk a lot about audience. How do you attract an audience outside of the people that are just already interested in science um, we talk about the, the isolation of the scientific community and the, the, the scientific media community, you know, the, the myths that we kind of have that we, we need to use. Uh, we always need to put uh, phrases in our articles that like more research is needed or, you know, this research is going to um, might one day lead to a better robot or a better drone or something. Uh, like it's just there's always these taglines that we put in. Because the scientific community, the science media community believes, well, that's what you have to do in order to make people interested in the science. And maybe that's true, but I don't know. Um, and Jay also talks about some positive case studies. Um, there was a, a Lancet commission on uh, dementia that he mentions, uh, and it's this big body. Well, he'll explain it, but it's a big body of, of research that, that, that continually gets updated on dementia risks. And he talks about how this is an interesting uh, way for scientists to be presenting their work because they go into, you know, all of these things, the risks, how they change, how they, how some things are now new risks, some things we're maybe taking off the list, but it really kind of shows the slow moving process of science and um, is a nice, um, communication format. And he mentions the Defy Dementia podcast that he is hosting, uh, which will be linked in the show notes. So you can you can take a look uh, uh, at that. And he talks about the approach that they're doing there of not beating people over the head with advice, but really just trying to present everything in a way that the people can then, um, you know, make their own decisions about you know, some of these dementia risks and stuff like that. And so it's some really great insight into science communication. But there's also some really interesting uh, dementia facts in there, too. So definitely worth uh, listening to that section. As always, I really, really enjoy talking with Jay Ingram. Like I said, he's got a wealth of experience um, and knowledge in this area. And like many episodes where we kind of talk about the, the nuts and bolts of science communication, it sometimes feels like we don't have solid answers. And I think that, that you know, that's true. We, we, we probably won't, right? Um, but this conversation for me definitely shows where we could focus our attention and what new things might we might try in order to um, maybe break out of some of the, 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 the myths, like I said, that, that we all have uh, in this field. But then also um, for, a, for an audience, you know, that likes to consume, um, you know, science stuff, I assume that's why, <laughs> why you're listening to this show. Uh, it's a good uh, reminder of the things to look for, right? And I think seeing how professional science, you know, media journalists and scientists think about data and the struggles of how the struggles we have of how to present it to audiences is informative for audiences to to see you know what it is that we're trying to get across and you know you can comment you can get in touch with the show about what it is that you would like to see how would you like to see these these topics handled so with that please get in touch with the show at two brad for you on x and instagram uh, you can email the show to Brad for you at gmail.com. Um, and you can please comment, subscribe, like, follow all of that stuff, wherever you're getting your podcast, that really helps the show. Um, and yeah, 
that would be great. We would love to hear from you. So um, without any further uh, ramblings on by me, here is my conversation with Jay Ingram. All right, Jay, welcome back. It's always a always a pleasure to see you. Uh, thanks for taking the time. How are you? I'm well, thanks, and uh, thanks for having me back on. I must, I must have passed the test the last time. Hey, you're one of the few people that just keeps saying yes. So, uh, <laughs> so, 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 so there you go. So that's how I qualify. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, I I think the audience you know that has followed since the beginning of the show knows you by now. Broadcaster, writer, you've been in science communication, science journalism for for decades um, in Canada, and I'm sure you've worked in in some other places as well. But the Canadian audience will know you very well. But yes, you do say yes to come on so that's a that's a bonus for me but i always really enjoy these kind of conversations because today we're gonna again have this idea of kind of getting into the weeds of science communication you know what works what doesn't work there's some of these questions that kind of float around and have been floating around maybe more closer to the surface since since covid um but that we don't really have a lot of good answers to uh but yet i feel like we should discuss them, we should probe them, we should talk about them. And the one that I want to bring up today is this idea of um, how do we present, you know, topics that maybe aren't settled, right? So that's that's a phrase that gets turned around. The science isn't settled. How do we discuss these things? Obviously, this was a big thing with COVID. I don't want to really talk about COVID because I think people are kind of sick of it. Uh, and I wanted to take a look at a case study that's maybe a bit different because COVID was very acute it seemed more obvious that, yes, we don't know what's going on. That was, as much as people maybe forget, that was a lot of a bit of the mantra at the beginning, right? We don't know what's going on. What I want to talk to you about today is, well, the case study would be a book by Jonathan Haidt, who is a pretty famous, I'd say, public intellectual researcher. Uh, and he's written a book uh, about the influence of social media on the, the development of teens, the prevalence or, or the increase of uh, teen depression, this kind of topics you've probably heard of before. And he's making a very strong link in the book. His argument is big part of it is social media and kids not having sort of free play anymore. It's become very, very popular. I think a lot of people, it's on New York Times bestsellers. But then sporadically here and there, I see sort of the other side, right? Researchers being like, well, it's not that simple. And, you know, they have their ideas. But what I notice is that the critiques don't fall into the mainstream. There are usually in, you know, science news, very dedicated science news or, you know, PBS, you know, some smaller news channels. So this is kind of this dilemma um, that I wanted to maybe discuss with you today is you got this this big hit book. You're a big public, you know, intellectual scientist. But does that tell the whole story? And what does an audience do when presented with a figure like this who has a book that's probably written very compelling? Um, how do they tease out, well, is this the whole story? Do they even care? And so I thought maybe a good way to start, if you don't have, you know, just general thoughts at the beginning as I've th thrown all this at you, um, my idea to start the conversation was actually to sort of brainstorm, well, what is it about a science topic like this that vaults it into the mainstream, that puts it into, you know, a New York Times bestseller, puts it on the tongues of everybody who's talking on social media and stuff, um, that's not necessarily the science. The first thing that comes to mind is, is the scientist a likable and good communicator? Because that's going to go a long way to get those ideas out there, even if the ideas are controversial or let's say not totally um, as settled as they might be presenting them. So as you said, uh, Haidt is a public intellectual. Uh, you don't get that kind of status by saying irrelevant things or not saying them very well. And so, um, <laughs> you know, while I, I haven't read his book, I do know that he's advocating pretty strongly for n no cell phone use uh, mm -hmm. you know, among young people, as he thinks that uh, the connection between phones and social media and distraction and polarization, those are all connected. And, um, you know, it, one of your questions in there was, uh, you know, how do 
How does an individual like him have an impact? Well, it, if he's actually suggest, I'm suggesting that uh, cell phone use should be dramatically curbed, particularly in schools, I guess, um, you're mm-hmm. going to get people's attention because um, not only every kid <laughs> might be affected by, you know, such a movement, but uh, school administrators, school teachers, um, and then everybody, every parent who's concerned about how their kid is growing up, maturing, and learning. So, you know, if you if you write about something that is so that so broadly affects people, I think you're bound to get attention. He's a big name already. He's a good writer. Mm-hmm. That's why he's a big name. So I think this is the combination. But, you know, if we're going to talk about um, science and its impact on people, um, you know, I'm not sure that that is the best book simply because it's more, as you said, social science than, than science. And, you know, as opposed to that, how about, I'm going back a ways for this, but how about um, Stephen Hawking's or Carl Sagan's books about the universe? Now, and you can immediately see the, the disjunct there because books about the universe don't affect mm-hmm, your life. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> I mean, unless you're... Unless you're planning to be immortal. So, you know, it just... Or have some kind of existential angst. Yeah, exactly. But I'm not going to get into existential angst about the sun consuming the earth in four billion years. You know, it just... (laughs) I don't care. Um, So (laughs) so then... So one of the questions, which isn't exactly the question you asked me, but nonetheless, is how is it that books like that that have unlike hate's book, have no impact, like really, other than, you know, prompting a conversation with people, have no impact on your life. And, you know, somewhere, and I've actually always been curious as to why astronomy and cosmology, um, and even setting aside the search for extraterrestrials, just stuff about the universe and the evolution of the universe and the origin of the universe, Why is it so popular? And, you know, I I wonder if perhaps it's popular because it's both spectacular in time, range, and size, and everything else. It's actually, well, it is beyond our comprehension, and we sort of understand that. Uh, But also because it doesn't challenge anybody uh, other than flat earthers or people who believe that uh, you know, the universe was created in 4004 BC. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, you know, those people, assi- and even the people who are creationists can latch on to a book, uh, a Stephen Hawking book, and say, this is the glory of God that he's talking about. You know, mm-hmm. what other entity could do this? But j- for most people, it it is... Uh, an item of um, curiosity and maybe mind-blowing curiosity, but it stops there. It doesn't say anything about the price of groceries or how you're going to lead your day. And so Mm -hmm. a a lot of science, uh, well, at least that branch of science, astronomy and cosmology, succeeds for reasons that I'm, I'm not totally clear on. But let me give you another mm-hmm. example that, that hews a bit closer to this line, which is um, you probably know about Huberman and his amazingly popular podcast, right. which um, sometimes infuriates people. And there was a recent mm-hmm. case. He did a podcast on, uh, on marijuana and its effects. And I started seeing on X... Uh, comments by neuroscientists, some of whom I know, deploring how inaccurate and misleading this entire podcast was. And Mm -hmm. besides noticing these comments, I also noticed they were talking to each other, to other neuroscientists, lamenting this scar on neuroscience that had just been perpetrated (laughs) by Huberman. And so one of these people, um, and I can... You know, he's, he's already 
publicly um, linked to this, so I can name him, a guy named Matt Hill at the University of Calgary, who is really a bona fide THC expert. He's been researching mm -hmm. cannabinoids forever. That's basically his career. He's well established. He's well respected. And I knew him. So, you know, I just in, I said to him, I don't know that I was the first person to say this, but I said, you should actually talk directly to Huberman and ask to be on a show because telling other mm -hmm. neuroscientists is going nowhere. Mm -hmm. So he did get in touch with Huberman. I haven't listened to the results yet, but he was on Huberman's show. I don't even know if that episode has been released yet. But, you know, in terms of how do you try and set the record straight? And you mentioned, you know, the beginnings of COVID and how there was a lot of uncertainty. And so it's not just setting the record straight, but uh, trying to keep people up to date without misleading them in one direction or the other. I thought that mm -hmm. was probably the best he could do because, and this relates to hate as well, people that have a platform already are in a very, very powerful, sometimes impregnable position. And, you know, my bet would be, even though I thought Matt Hill did exactly the right thing by going on Huberman, in the long run, is Huberman going to lose an audience over this? I really doubt it. I think he's going to no. go on. Uh, you know, he and Lex Friedman and other people like that have enormous audiences for good reason. I mean, they do mm -hmm. really interesting podcasts. Now, whether they're, they're all true or not, talking here more about Huberman than Friedman, um, is up for grabs. I mean, you know, who knows? But they're very difficult to dislodge. And so reputation has a huge role to play. And, you know, if I don't think there are many scientists who have a, you know, a huge audience and continually come out with untruths. But that is one of the most important things to think about is if you disagree, if a scientist disagrees with what other scientists are saying, uh, how do you approach that? You know, it, mm -hmm. it reminds me of the what are now seem to be very rare debates between creationists and evolutionists. And mm -hmm. I've attended such things, and it quickly became clear to me that they're absolutely pointless because there yeah. will never be a single person in the audience who changes his or her mind as a result of the debate. They, and, and they're really speaking over each other anyway, right? Or around each mm -hmm. other. But the point is, they're fixed in their views. No evolutionist is going to become a creationist and vice versa. And, and so you have to be very careful. You have to pick your spots. I don't like what this person is saying. I think it's misleading. How do I address it? And, you know, going back to the fundamental principle of communication, who's the audience? Who are you trying to reach in your, uh, you know, your disagreement? I mean, that's where Matt Hill did the right thing. Go to the source, get on the air with the source, and that is your mm -hmm. best chance because you're, you're then you're then at least reaching the audience that Huberman previously reached. Now, whether they listen to yeah. you or not is another question over which you have no control. Because that's what I was going to say, too, is that, like, as much as, you know, I feel like some of those podcasts, you know, the Huberman, the, the Friedmans, you know, you could put something even less loosely, <laughs> you know, uh, linked to science, but the Joe Rogan stuff, you yeah. know, it's it's the people that are listening to that have already made up their mind too, right? Like whether you're pro marijuana or against marijuana, you hear both episodes. I would, I'm, I wonder if anyone even listens to the, to the counter episode, you know, they, they've listened to the episode on, you know, the, 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 the bad things about marijuana that fits their belief. They hear someone that's going to come on and argue the other side. Do they even listen to it? I don't know. So it just, it feels like a bit of an, yeah, damned if you well, do. You, so the, the, you know, Huberman retains all the control. If he called 
uh, his and Hill's discussion, and we don't know how he's going to format it, but if he called it more on marijuana, people would listen. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. But, you know, um, you mentioned Joe Rogan. So I've listened to one Joe Rogan podcast, and it's because I was researching um, these efforts largely centered in Silicon Valley to extend the human life Mm -hmm. span. Yeah, big topic and, on his show, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, and he, so he invited a guy who, whose work or whose theories, at least, I was familiar with, and I just wanted to get a little bit better depth. And it was a really good interview. Uh, mm-hmm. And, you know, so when people disparage Rogan, um, they seldom take that second step of, saying, well, okay, you know, I saw this ridiculous comment he made on X. Actually, this was yesterday about uh, how Canada is going down the toilet because of its government. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, I mean, the, it is tempting to take a comment like that and say, I'll never listen to this BS right. again. But the point is, there are people that don't know anything about Canada, which would include a large part of his audience, and they were interested in the in this aging topic. And it was a good, clear interview. And he got a lot of information that one would want to know. Mm-hmm. So again, you have to consider the audience. And, you know, who's ever an, analyzed a Joe Rogan audience to see if there's uh, a split between those who listen to his political nonsense and those who listen to the guest? Yeah. Because, you know, they're, I don't know. But there may be uh, quite a difference. I mean, so it's a yeah, it's a, I mean, if you're asking the general question of how does a disgruntled scientist um, try to counteract uh, stuff that he thinks is inaccurate or uh, even inflammatory and wrong, how best to do it? It's a tricky landscape. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, without going too far into all of the discussions of the different podcasts, I would, I feel like I should say, too, like I've listened to a lot of <laughs> Joe Rogan uh, and I was, you know, it's kind of what got me into podcasting uh, and especially when he had those scientific guests on and he generally did a really good job of, you know, being the being the dumb guy in the room and asking the question that the audience wants to hear, you know, wants to they got this chance to hear this big science person um so i i just i really like that point and that split in the audience of who's listening to the guest and who's listening because that was what i fell into was the the camp of listening to the guest and then eventually got so frustrated with all of the other nonsense that i just stopped listening altogether um but it's one thing i think for you know as i think it's a great example you have of a scientist who's like, let me, I need to correct the record. Or, you know, if you're just speaking to your peers and and lamenting the fact that this is out there, then yeah, you're, it's, that's going to do nothing. So that was one of the thoughts I had on my notes over this episode, you know, what do you do? What's your, what's your responsibility if you feel like you need to get that other side out there? And so going to the source, going to, to the places where you heard this information uh, is one thing, but it's, I wonder how many people, yeah, like didn't if maybe if you didn't give that prompt or, you know, didn't give that advice, how many people would be, you know, would know what to do or would know how to do it or know how to reach out to media uh, in any sense. And then how much of it is on the media itself to sort of get that other side. As someone that works in science journalism, I feel like, you know, that if I'm as a freelancer, if I saw that other side to a big topic, I would be like, oh, that's something I could pitch. You know, that's something that would gain some some interest because it's the yeah. counter side. But it never seems to get as much interest as the initial thing. Right. So let me. Um, so there's two things there. What what does a scientist do? Mm-hmm. What does the media do? And uh, I'll talk about the scientists. And if I forget to get to the media, you can remind yeah. me. So. Um, One of the things I noticed about the Matt Hill-Huberman thing was that the neuroscientists talking to Matt, because there was a kind of a discussion about should he, what should he do, how should he do it, they were intimidated, it seemed to me. They were worried that Rogan was going to, sorry, Huberman, Mm -hmm. interchangeable. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Huberman was going to edit it in a way that made Matt look bad 
And they were saying, and this wasn't a, a bad idea, but it reflects an attitude. Oh, you should, you should be recording it at the same time. Mm -hmm. So then if he edits it in a way that makes you look wrong, well, you can counter, you know, which of course implied, oh my God, how long is this thing going to go on with a dwindling audience the whole time? Um, but it reflected an attitude that when, and it's partly right. If you're going to take on someone with a giant audience, um, you have to be care. You have to be sure that you're going to get some sort of fair hearing, even though I think it's the only way to do it. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, there are a lot of scientists, cannabinoid researchers, who don't care what Huberman says. And even if they knew that he had broadcast, you know, falsehoods, they would just say, well, I don't, that's not up to me to do that. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm doing my research. I have my grant money to do my research. I teach classes. I get paid for doing that. That's what I do. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that's fine. I mean, I've, I've, I've met, <laughs> I haven't met a huge number of scientists who scan the public media all the time looking for things that they feel they should respond to. Mm -hmm. And I would just add to that, seeing as how we're basically talking about everything here, there are people who are quite public in their efforts to combat mis- and disinformation. And I think they're ignoring who is the audience as well, because they regularly post on X. Here's more information that um, conservative, poli conservative people are more accepting of misinformation than people who aren't conservative. Well, just think about that for a sec. Who, who, who is going to pay any attention to that? The people who aren't conservatives will have just had their ideas confirmed. So big deal. You've confirmed, you've entrenched them in their already held opinion, and there's not really much point in doing that. Conservatives will look at it and say, oh, well, you know, he's a lib. More, yeah, more liberal nonsense, yeah. <laughs> and, and more, yeah, yeah, and, you know, woke. Yeah. And, dis and disregard it. So, so why, why are you doing it? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's laudable to try and combat misinformation. My point only is that's not the right way to do it. Mm -hmm. So, and then on the other side of the coin, just to sort of try and, you know, paint a family portrait of the kinds of people that are involved in these topics. Um, you know, David Suzuki has been savaged by politicians for decades. Was he ever wrong? He may have stated things, you know, strongly, but he was never really wrong. As we, you know, I sit here in Calgary and we have like eight straight days of plus 30 mm -hmm. temperatures. Um, <clears throat> you know, no one can reasonably or rationally claim at this point that, that there's no effect on of climate change. And so what do you do about that? It, it's, it's an asymmetric battle. He's using scientific data. People will always, to buttress his argument, uh, his opponents will always find something. Oh, yeah, sure. Well, there was a heat wave in 1927 where the temperatures were exactly the same as they are today. All of this stuff that is irrelevant. And the problem is, Opponents of science don't really dig very deep into the data. And this is where you have a problem in um, expressing uh, dissatisfaction with somebody's work because you have to get into the process of science. Hey, we're not sure what's happening right now. That kind of admission that, that no scientist wants to make. Mm -hmm. And you have to... People have to understand before you approach them with some sort of, you know, contra argument to what's prevalent. They have to understand a little bit about the process of science and getting across the process of science. I don't think has ever been done very well. 
Yeah, and I think, but so then this is kind of, I don't know. I have I've had a, a recent episodes have delved more into the 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 process of science communication and all these kind of topics and I oh I always struggle at about this point in the episode where it starts to look really bleak <laughs> you know like what are we what's the point really because uh, especially when you think about you know these big topics you know like and when we just at the beginning touched on why you know it's going to reach a huge audience when you talk about raising kids or you know health you know, health stuff is is like Huberman, you know, who's a neuroscientist. And now it's kind of the whole thing is like optimizing your health and like hacking the body and like all this. So there's tons of stuff going on there that is, I'd say, dubious or at least we'll say unsettled science, right? Like it's you get one right. or two studies right. and it's like, OK, this you know, looks good. Um, but as we know, the process of science would take longer and longer and longer for these things to play out. So without having to explain that process, without being able to explain that process, like where do you go to find that audience to, you know, do that work, let's say, of explaining the process so you can get that little bit of knowledge? Because like you said, Twitter is not going to do it. You can go to the source, but... I don't know. So it just feels like if that's the way that you have to sort of approach critiquing these things, but how do you get anybody to pay attention to that? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, what that requires is um, a long read, uh, some in-depth, and you need some really concrete examples of how um, science evolves. And people already know this. I mean, we were talking earlier about um you know the universe, and why is it? Why is it so? Why are images and and ideas about the universe so compelling? The other day, I was reading that if you uh, you know a certain way of treating quantum mechanics might show that time is an illusion. Okay, well, <laughs> you know, um, if you looked at the equivalent statement in medical science, it would be pretty dramatic. Yeah. It would be something like, you must never eat another potato for the rest of your life or something like that. We've been wrong. Time is an illusion. But, you know, saying that time is an, an illusion affects nobody. Yeah. They still get up at seven in the morning yeah. and have breakfast and, you know, go out and work or do whatever the they do. The train is still going to show um, up at 730 whether you're there or not. Yeah. Exactly. It might be an illusion, but the train's going to be there anyway. Uh, whereas if you say you're eating all the wrong food, um, you know, uh, that's something that hits people and people don't like being told that what they're doing is wrong. And so either people that sort of have a, an interest in um, the backdrop to that, you know, we used to think this. Then it evolved to this, and now we've come to that. I accept that. But people who haven't paid much attention and are being told that their diet is terrible uh, are likely going to question the science. Mm -hmm. I don't know. <laughs> I've thought about this uh, quite a lot with the help of some other <laughs> friends of mine about how to do the process of science, and I haven't yet hit on what would seem to be a good vehicle for that because it comes back to um you know the idea that uh, those who already believe that or understand that science is a process and our ideas are inevitably going to change uh are cool with that and those who want to know whether the vaccine is 100 percent safe or not uh, are not going to be uh, cool with that but you know there's a huge amount of willful misunderstanding going on too. There is no vaccine that is safe, 100% mm -hmm. safe. It's gotten to the point where uh, advocates of the COVID vaccines are afraid to say that. Yeah. Because you cannot, in this battle between anti-vaxxers and uh, reasonable people, there's, there's no common ground there, you know? It's just... It, it's two islands of people hurling uh, words at each other. And so I don't really know. Now, you also mentioned the role of the media. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, 
if you're if you're working for a magazine or one of the few online newspapers that still has a science correspondent, again, you're talking to your people, right? A science column in a in a news in an online newspaper only attracts people who are kind of interested in science. Yeah. So they'll accept it from you. You know, uh, you know, there's always this throwaway phrase. Uh, of course, we need to do more research. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, which is one of those phrases that now nobody pays any attention yeah. to. I've found I've and tried so to people, find so many different ways of writing that exact thing without saying those words, just to, just because it's like every article. <laughs> I think if you're going to tackle it, <clears throat> I think you should write an article just on that. And, and nothing else and take some sort of headline that everybody is uh, paying attention to and just say right out, you know, we don't know how long this is going to be seen to be nearly 100% true. And we don't know how long it's going to be before it's only 75% true. But that is inevitable. Yeah. Somebody's got to say that. So maybe it should be you because, you know, throwing away, of course, more research needs to be done. It's right up there with we think this study of dragonfly flight may lend itself to creating new, more mobile robots. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that you know what? That's an actually usually an outright lie. Yeah. But it's it's just an effort. It just shows the the isolation in some senses of the scientific community, where some writer, it may not be the scientist but it might be, thinks unless you connect it to robots, people aren't going to care. Yeah. Well, you're right. Most people don't care about how dragonflies are amazing flyers. They see them, they think, oh, that's kind of cool. It can fly backwards. They don't think about how. Yeah. And, and you know, probably if asked, should uh, $2 million be dispensed to figure out how? They might say no until you say, but it might make better robots. <laughs> I'm sorry, I shouldn't laugh because it's not a funny topic, but I, and maybe it's clear from the way I've been talking, I've had um, trouble sorting out exactly how you should do this. I can give you an example of where I think people have been very careful, mm. and that is the Lancet Commission on Dementia Risks. So they came out in 2017, and the Lancet Commissions are huge arrays of international scientists who evaluate data around a topic. And in 2017, they published a list of risks for dementia that you can do something about. You, like you, Brad, mm. can do something about in your life. And then in 2020, they updated it and added a, cu added a couple more, and they've just it's embargoed as you and I speak, but they've added a couple more risks and solidified the evidence around some of the risks they previously identified. And that's really what I like about it. I'm afraid to look we at it because they're going to tell that, me to not drink beer, and I don't know if I'm ready for that. Um, they're allowing you to drink some beer. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Just not a lot. But if you smoke, you should stop. Yeah. That's quit that um, decades if, ago. If you um, d uh, do things that uh, increase your risk of traumatic brain injury, you should stop. Mm -hmm. No. If you have diabetes, you should stop. Um, anyway, I'm not going to go yeah, yeah, through yeah. all 14 <laughs> risks. But m my point is that um, they've done this in a very uh, steady, thorough way, and not just adding risks, but also reviewing the previous risks and evaluating them in light of evidence that has accumulated since 2017, <laughs> 2020, and so on. And so I have a particular interest in this because I'm doing a podcast called Defy Dementia, where we are communicating with people about these risks and what you could and should do in your life to reduce your risk of dementia, or even reduce your um, progression, even if you've been diagnosed hmm. with mild cognitive impairment or dementia. So it's a great example, and it is getting the press, at least 
mostly in the UK, but it, it sort of comes over to North America as well. Um, that these, and you know what? They're, they're not always changes in your life that people want to hear. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I like having 12 drinks a week. Well, maybe that's too many. You should stop smoking. If you've got a wood stove and there's smoke all over the place, you're increasing your risk of dementia. So you might want to do something about hmm. that. So, you know, but they're not, they're not telling you, you must, you're not saying I'm going to get, I'm going to, you know, add a carbon tax to your life because there's really good evidence that that would help fight climate change. They're not doing it that way. Mm-hmm. They're just saying, look, here are the risks. Uh, we encourage you. We don't force you. We encourage you to take some steps and you'll be better off. And so will your kids and your family and anybody else who might end up being a caregiver. Mm-hmm. So so that's one topic. Yeah. I don't know. And I mean, and I think, you know, as much as I said, the, the medical space, there's a lot of stuff that's frustrating in communication. That's also an example of where because... You know, people want that information. It's the same thing with the height book, right? To kind of just bring it back to that. People want to know about what, well, what should I do with my kids? I think in some ways, now that I'm a father, people want too much to be told. <laughs> What's the right thing? <laughs> There's so much information out there. But anyway, that's yeah. another topic. Um, yeah. But it's, I think this then comes to, to audience. So you, ha- the people that are going to seek out this information on dementia, probably, you know, I, w- I would guess a lot of them maybe have experience with it in their life or something like that. So they're going to see that they're going to respond to that. Again, how does that get into sort of the mainstream? You know, like if you're if if your goal as someone who's who's done this research, who's done this this panel, whatever I can't remember what you called the consortium, whatever, um, the goal would obviously we should get this out there to as many people as possible because it's good, you know, it's the best information we have. You know, what are the, I guess, the vehicles to do that? And this brings me to a question that I've juggled with in the last little bit, again, in previous episodes and stuff is, well, does everybody need to know everything, you know, when it comes to science and science news? Uh, this would seem like a topic that would you would want to know about. And it seems to me more and more that like what you want to call it legacy media, traditional media, the news media, that cycle, that way of, of covering topics doesn't work for this material. Like it's just, it it's you square peg round hole kind of thing. It's just, it's not going to work. You're not going to be able to get that nuance. You're not going to be able to find those audiences. So then what is it? Because Twitter or X, I don't know if that's the spot. Podcasts, I think, are great, but people have to find your podcast. I don't know. This this seems, again, like one of those, I'm throwing a bunch of stuff up here, and I, I don't yeah, think yeah. any of us have the answer. Well, so um, if I could just go back to the uh, uh, lifestyle risks for dementia, uh, one of the it, one of the values, and I've already said this, is that it, it has a consistency. It isn't just a one-time thing. Mm-hmm. So it comes back and people remember it vaguely from the time before, so they might be more interested in how it's evolved. So you are nailing the science evolves subject mm-hmm. down by that. But the other thing is that, and you, you mentioned that, oh, in the audience, there's probably a lot of people have had dementia in their lives. Is there anybody living today who hasn't had dementia in their family somewhere or their friends. Uh, I doubt it. Mm -hmm. I've never, I've never spoken to an audience where somebody put up their hands and have no connection with dementia whatsoever. Yeah. And even if you didn't and you realize the amount of money that would be saved if a healthcare system managed to persuade people to change their lifestyles such that the result would be dementia in general would be delayed by five years. Mm -hmm. The amount of savings would be absolutely incredible. There's going to be 150 million people with dementia by 2050. Uh, The shortage of caregivers by 2030 is in the U S is estimated to be well over a hundred thousand. So it, 
it has multiple benefits. It's not just you. Mm -hmm. And you may not get dementia. It's society might not get as much dementia. So I think that when a story has those kinds of attributes, that it's people have some experience. I mean, if you had a if you had an equ equivalent periodic report telling people what your future um, uh, income would be or something like that, you would eat that up, right? yeah. especially if you'd seen over a period of five or six years that it had turned out to be accurate. It's just that, you know, there aren't many stories that are quite so reliable and personal. Mm -hmm. And I think those are two, uh, two aspects of a topic. Now, where, are, you know, you mentioned legacy media. I think um, New York Times, Washington Post, papers like that mm -hmm. um, are still um, are still effective. There are these, they're the equivalent in Europe and, and the UK. Um, but, you know, are like, do 20 year olds read that sort of stuff? Uh, and how do you get, see, it doesn't really matter to talk social media, legacy media, a book, whatever, um, the format is um, less important than the age group and the interests of the audience you're trying to mm -hmm. get. So, you know, a book will uh, resonate with some people. Tonight's article will resonate with some people. And I don't think a single person can be so... Well, first of all, working 24 hours a day. Secondly, researching every uh, source of information to try and hit the best one. Because inevitably, in science, some topics should be on one medium and some topics should be on a different one. Mm -hmm. And you'd have to be an awfully erudite journalist to know instantly when you came across a story where it should be put. And you'd also have to be incredibly skilled to be able to put it there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and so then this is kind of like it, bring, it makes me, you know, again, in some of these thoughts is like, so, you know, like, the science section of a, of a paper. OK, so New York Times, Washington Post, they probably have a really good science correspondent that is is versed in science, like that knows that beat really well. Right. Whereas maybe even like something like the CBC or, 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 you know, let's go down the list. If they even have a science, there, maybe it's somebody that, you know, did health or did environment or something before, but it's not, you know, is not there. Yeah. So there's that lack of, of, you know, knowledge in the institutions, in those institutions there. And then you have, you know, some of the stuff that I do, which is your know, very dedicated science news magazines, you know, the scientific Americans, yeah. the, the chemistry worlds, you know, like the, the places. So it's like, I don't expect, you know, even, you know, I know my mom reads some of them, but, you know, people in my, in my peer group, you know, like outside of that, I don't think they're reading, they're going to be reading the stuff I put out in chemistry world, right? Because it doesn't matter to them, that kind of thing. But this is, I guess, I guess I'm trying to think about where... Yeah, placing different topics and different things are in different mediums. And, and I think an audience has a lot to do with it, as, you know, with the social media stuff. Like if you want to hit young people, you got to be on TikTok. If you want to get the older people, uh, maybe podcasts, millennials, podcasts, that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I think it's, it's, it's tough because I agree with what you were saying earlier, this noble pursuit of sort of wanting to get the correct thing out there and get people to sort of understand, you know, what it means when we say it's not settled and why, you know, maybe, maybe don't change your whole life, you know, style based on a Huberman podcast. I feel like there's a lot of people that are probably ping ponging from, you know, diet to diet to, to hack to hack, you know, and you're never seeing any results, but constantly being like, I'm doing it. Um, Maybe a series of some like a YouTube series or something or a couple series of videos. I'm dabbling into YouTube now. So maybe this is me convincing myself to do this. 
but explaining the difference in the different studies, right? Because like what's a meta-analysis versus a, a review versus a clinical trial versus, which sounds incredibly boring, I think, to a lot of people. But how, if you knew the differences between that, your ability to then look at a Huberman podcast and look at the, the journals quickly that they're citing there and say, oh, yeah, maybe the weight of evidence, not so, so much on that, but this one has a systemic review, you know, that kind of meta-analysis, that kind of thing. So, but I mean, how do you teach people that? Because that seems like super boring. Well, you, it is. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, you. You can't, well, you can't do it that way. What you'd have to do is when uh, you feel compelled to respond to statements coming from somebody that you think are inaccurate or gloss over the truth or whatever. It's only then when the story is in the news that it's really appropriate to start talking about meta-analyses or, uh, you know, uh, retrospective trials yeah, yeah, and yeah. use that. I, I had an interesting, here's an interesting example, again, drawn from uh, dementia studies, uh, showing that um, there was one study about alcohol, so you'll be interested in this. <laughs> you that, saw my eyes uh, light up. <laughs> <laughs> that um, consumption, overconsumption of alcohol was definitely a risk, but so was abstinence. Hmm. Now that's puzzling, right? It's puzzling until you realize that a lot of people who are abstinent are so because they had to stop drinking. Ah. And as a result, they have a backlog of damage done by the alcohol before they became abstinent. And so that's a tiny example of how you have to scrutinize the participants in a study to really get an accurate picture of what the study is all about. And so if I were, um, if I were to tackle the issue of how do you get across the uh, the idiosyncrasies, that's not quite the right word, but the, the, the detailed structure of a study that allows somebody to make statements about it, you have to have the study there in, in people's minds. Mm -hmm. You can't come at it because, you know, doing it as a, here's a, here's a meta-analysis, here's this, here's that. That's too much like being in school. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and you, you know, you hated it when you were in school and it was only later uh, some of us realized that was actually kind of interesting and important. Yeah. But people are too busy to be sent back to school. Yeah, they don't want to lecture. And so, exactly. Whereas, if, um, you know, and I, I don't want to belabor the Huberman example, but a, an example like that where you feel like somebody's disseminating false information, take one component of it and say, here's how that was arrived at. Here's why. There are problems with that. Mm -hmm. Then it becomes much more interesting. It's much more of a solving a mystery, a detective story. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. I, and you know, you, we can't um, we can't forget that in all of this, you have to be telling stories. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, I think you know. I think in politics they talk about the process story, right? That that gets put out there in, in PR and stuff every once in a while, they do a process story of you know, how they arrived at these conclusions. And obviously there's different, it's a different realm and a different you know reason why you would put some of those out. But that's kind of what I'm thinking of. And it just made me think something that I've been thinking a lot of, this is my last thought before I let you go, um, is just what can, you know, people like me, science journalists, science people in science media, let's say science communication, or who are you know, passionate about it, um, learning from other areas, you know, like learning from sports broadcasting or, you know, these just other yeah. entertainment mediums. I think that thinking maybe a little outside the box and trying to grab from, from different places, it's, it's never going to be a perfect fit, perfect analogy, you know, but I feel like there's, there's a lot left on the table that, that, people in the science space haven't explored. Well, uh, yeah, because, and again, I'm <laughs> repeating myself, but it's because they don't think of, uh, um, A, the audience, and B, that every 
every story is about people. Mm -hmm. You know, I hosted a um, TV show in Canada called Daily Planet for like 16 years. And um, it was said to be a science show, but it wasn't. It was a people show like every single television program ever. It's just that the people had some sort of connection, sometimes remote, sometimes intimate, to science and technology. And so unless you pin your, you know, dis you're, you're disturbed by something, unless you pin that on some kind of story with some kinds of people in it, uh, the rest, the audience isn't going to be interested. And so, you know, I think you're absolutely right. Look at sports. I mean, really, a lot of sports coverage is pretty tedious. Yeah, but, but people it, love it. But, you know, <laughs> people love it. But why do they love it? Well, for one thing, they have a strong allegiance mm -hmm. to a team. Yeah. For completely irrational reasons. This team, which is owned by some billionaire, happens to be located in my town. Yeah. So I love them and I hate all the others. Even though if I met the players in this team, I'd probably hate most of them too. It doesn't Not matter. My you've team. got it. You've, yeah, I know. <laughs> of course. Go Oilers. <laughs> um, the that allegiance is what drives people's attention and thoughts. And in the same way, if you set aside sports and look at how polarized the political world is right now, that's all about allegiance. Mm -hmm. And it's allegiance to some kind of nebulous idea, but it's mostly because, hey, I agree with all these other people yeah. who are saying these things. It, it, it does not involve analysis. There, you know, more sports fans love their team come hell or high water than actually start thinking about, you know, that player that everyone loves is really ineffective. That, co oh, let's talk about the Blue Jays. Their management is terrible. Yeah. They have a bad team again. Yeah. Surely, you know, and acute uh, writers pick that up, but it's their beat. Yeah. Right. And so they already have an audience. And this is the problem when you're trying to do equivalent things in science is that the audience, the, um, the number of committed audience members is much left. So much less. Yeah. So some of those techniques aren't going to work. Yeah. And that's, I'm glad that's your last question because I can't think of anything else. To say. <laughs> well, well, you said yes to coming on the podcast. So that was enough for me. And I, I've taken up your yeah, time yeah. now. So right. I, Again, I, I, I want to put this part as I'm saying goodbye to you, to the audience, you know, listening to these, because I think they've listened to a few of these where I've brought up a lot of these questions and I put them to other people in this field and people I respect and that I think have more, you know, experience than me. Um, but yeah, we don't have proper answers. So it, it always ends up feeling a little, you know, maybe uh, inconclusive. But that's kind of the topic that we're talking about is that these things evolve, they go on and on. So thanks for, thanks for putting in your two cents and thanks for, you know, maybe pushing, maybe pushing me a little bit closer to, to something and maybe pushing the audience a little bit closer to some kind of answers or resolution here. Uh, Jay, it's, it's always a pleasure to see you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Brad. Give me some easier questions. Next well, if time. you want to do a, a whole show about uh, the Edmonton Oilers and uh, how this year is definitely the year that we win it, <laughs> we could do that. Yeah, they're not my team. <laughs> it's not your team. All right. Fair enough. <laughs> There we have it. Thank you so much for tuning in uh, uh, to this episode. Thank you, as always, to The Freak Motif for the music, Sebastian Aboud for our, our logo and design. Um, and please let us know, let me know what you thought. Uh, reach out at 2 brad for you on X and Instagram. Uh, you can email the show 2 brad for you at gmail.com. Uh, like, follow, subscribe on those platforms, wherever you get your podcast, leave a review, that kind of stuff that really helps us. Uh, you can look at 2 brad for you uh, on YouTube. We're slowly going to start populating that page with more and more videos, more and more content. Uh, and please uh, subscribe there and leave us comments. Let us know what it is that you like, don't like and want to see. I'm trying to adapt everything to my audience as we learned in this uh, episode is so, so important. So thank you so much for, for, for joining us. And uh, well, until next time.
stay safe, be good to each other. Bye for now.